Dr. Shannon. Welcome to RealPod. I'm so glad you're here. So thanks for coming on. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me, Vic. This is perfectly aligned because I am at this place where I'm now, wait, I graduated college in 2019. It's about to be 2023. How many years has that been? 21, 22. Oh my God, it's four years since I was a college athlete. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, it was yesterday. Like I'm still taking my recovery break. (laughs) Every year that I get older, time goes faster. The years go faster. And my parents always said that. And I was like, yeah, whatever. That's not a thing. No, that's the real thing. (laughs) Yeah, it is. Time goes faster as you get older. Totally. And I'm just thinking now, wait, it was cute when like I had just graduated and I thought my whole life I've been working out and fitness and lifting and running and all these things. And now I just want to break. And I'm like, wait, that breaks kind of lasted a long time. I work out. I've had some good months, you know, but it's still really hard for me. I know the new year is that time where everyone's getting this big kick of like momentum, motivation. Oftentimes it's really toxic. It's okay. New year, new body or new health routine, you know, for aesthetic purposes. I'm glad to have you on today to kind of like rewrite the script and talk about how people like me can get fitness back into their lives, but not in this toxic way that we once knew. First off, I think that that's beautiful that you're even bringing up this conversation. And I want to say, I want to validate the fact that it's okay to have seasons of your life, sometimes years where you're not exercising and you are working more on healing your relationship to your body and to exercise. I always say that that has to come first before you think about progressing physically and gaining muscle and all the things that are awesome with exercise. A lot of times it's let's just rewire some associations with our body, with exercise. I think specifically with athletes, athletes have a hard time with this because they have been conditioned at such a young age that physical activity is associated with winning. And that a lot of times when your goal is physical activity for sports, that comes at a cost to some other part of your body, your physical health, your joint health, your emotional health. It's very common for athletes to feel all broken down. And so it's difficult for them to rewire their relationship around exercise that exercise isn't about winning. Exercise isn't about no pain, no gain. Exercise should be always building you up, never you know, potentially improving your performance, but at the cost at some other area of your body. So I just want to say that it is so normal for athletes to go through this where they're like, man, I'm having a really hard time changing my mindset around exercise and that it doesn't have to be black and white, all or nothing. Like it can be gentle and still extremely effective. So I think that that's totally valid for you to kind of go through that period where you're just focusing more on healing. Thanks. I think that is so important. And you hit the nail on the head because there isn't someone telling me I need to do these workouts so we can win this game or telling me how to work out. You know, all of it was like spoon fed. I mean, they're telling you show up on these days, just come ready. And, you know, we're going to tell you what to do and what to lift and what to eat. And it's kind of mapped out. And then you get to your independence and you're thinking, wait, like I've literally never had to be like self-motivated. It's weird because athletes are self-motivated, but when you really think about it, we always have a leader, a coach, a captain, and we are really good followers at the same time, you know? Totally. And there's an end game. Like there's an end result where with fitness, you're working out for the rest of your life. There's no finish line right? It's just, it has to become a part of your lifestyle in order to truly do its magic. Whereas with sports, it's okay. We've got this, you know, we've got the championship ahead of us. So there's an end line where in your brain, you're like, okay, I've got this finish line. And I always say like goals are amazing in exercise. And I think it's totally fine to even have aesthetic goals, but I recommend, you know, having also another goal that's not physical related. So I'm going to feel better, or I'm going to move my body in gentle ways, or like having more of those softer goals, because ultimately that will be what gives you that intrinsic motivation to continue showing up. Or for a lot of our members, it's like, I just, I want my, I want to be able to sit on a plane and not have my back hurt, or I want to be able to lift heavy things, or I want to be able, my personal goal is I want to be able to do a cartwheel when I'm 95. (laughs) Like I want to be able for my body to not, I don't want to slowly be breaking down my body. I want to be slowly building up my body. And I think that this messaging is unfortunately not very common in the fitness industry at all. Yeah. And I feel like I have experienced both aspects of it. The one is the athlete 
side that we've been explaining, but the other is growing up and also prior to like division one sports or really intense athletics. It was, you know, you work out to lose fat, you work out to change your body, you work out as a punishment for eating, you work out to stay skinny. There's this reason that doesn't make the workout enjoyable because you're literally in the workout thinking I'm doing this because I hate myself. And then obviously you hate working out. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And it's often perpetuated by the leaders in group fitness, right? They're like, you know, burn off that food that you ate this weekend, or you're burning so many calories, no pain, no gain. All of this is perpetuated. So a lot of it is just conditioning. It's not necessarily our fault, but once our eyes are open to the fact that, whoa, this conditioning is kind of jacked up and it's not really improving my body because maybe I'm improving the way it looks temporarily, but I'm not improving the way it feels because my joints are broken down. People get depleted. People get hormone issues over time from just overdoing it and pushing their bodies way too hard, way too aggressively. So yeah, it's interesting that it's, it, it is a struggle for so many people. I know you talk often about how focusing on the calories burned in a workout isn't necessarily the best way to judge if you've had a good workout or not. And that was actually something that really helped me because I will even be like on the Peloton And it's right there. I mean, you have resistance, you have your cadence. And then there's a little thing that says calorie number. And I try really hard. But the other day I did this workout. I was so proud of myself. And then I saw the calorie number and I just felt, oh, it's like I did nothing. Totally. It totally takes you out when you're tracking your calories. It totally takes you out of the intuitiveness that exercise should feel. I say that all the time, like exercise in my mind should be to build muscle and to improve our other aspects of our health, like our cardiovascular health, our metabolism, our immune system, our mental health. And as let's say perfect example that you just gave Vic, so many people will do like we do upper body build in our membership every week. And it's just focus on upper body. You could leave that workout and be like, my muscles feel burning. Like they feel like they really got great work my joints don't hurt. I feel energized. I don't feel depleted. And then you look down at your watch and it says, Oh, I only burn a hundred calories. And it completely negates all of that intuitiveness that you had about, Oh, this is actually an effective workout. So I recommend ditching the fitness watch completely. And I have, I ditched my fitness watch about three years ago and I've never looked back. What was your relationship like with the watch when you had it? Oh gosh. So messed up. Like I, I definitely come from a background of over-exercise, exercising to burn a lot of calories. I was teaching fitness way back in the day when I was, you know, in grad school and after grad school, and I would do a workout. I would potentially do a second workout that day. Like I would teach and then I would do another workout. And at the end of the day, if I didn't burn enough calories, I would literally run in place in my room. Like it was (laughs) to the point where it was just, I was so ruled by that thing. And my body felt horrible. Like it was, I had chronic pain all over my body. My back hurt, my knee hurt. I was getting treated in physical therapy every single week, spending a lot of money on it, a lot of time. And it was ultimately like I was thin, but I had no muscle. I was starting to get night terrors at night. So I was having sleep disturbances because I was just over exercising, slamming my body into the ground. And the scariest part is, is that I was conditioned to believe that that was a normal part of being fit, that it's normal to go get body work every single week because you're broken down. It's normal to have to sacrifice a lot of things in your life in order to fit your workout into your schedule. And I saw not only was it my problem, but all of the patients that I was seeing, I was kind of in, as a physical therapist, I was kind of in the fitness niche. So a lot of my patients were super fit. And they all had the exact same issue. All of them felt super broken down, depleted, exhausted. Their joints hurt everywhere. They were having to get treatment over and over and over. And it wasn't necessarily because they weren't stretching enough or they weren't doing enough mobility or they weren't getting enough massage. It was that they were overdoing it in their workouts. They were doing workouts that were inappropriate and ultimately costing their health. And I think, and it was so sad because again, at the time I would tell them, and I feel so guilty about this. I would tell them, well, that's just kind of the cost of being fit is that you're going to feel like crap. You're going to feel broken down. And I feel so guilty about that now because I'm like, oh my gosh, like it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, so many things. I'll start with that last thing you said. I mean, I was never a fitness coach, but I relate to thinking about 
a version of myself who maybe in high school or middle school was helping and encouraging my friends to be on diets or who said, let's all do this thing. Like that, that hurts me because that's not who I am anymore. And I've grown and but I think that's such a common feeling for anyone recovering from issues with food, body exercise is like what you did before you knew. And it's like, we have to forgive ourselves for that. Oh my gosh. Yes. And like how we acted, you know, it's like when you're at a war with yourself, of course you're a bitch to people. Of course you're fucking hungry. You are unhappy. You are projecting the hatred you have for yourself onto others. Like we do have to allow ourselves to recognize like we were just reacting to something that was really hard. Oh, that's so beautiful. Cause you're so right. Like I think a lot of times, a lot of us over exercise or under eat or have messed up relationships with our body, ultimately out of hatred for ourselves. And again, this comes from so much conditioning. I just go back to that, but it's true. And I, I love the idea of forgiving yourself for your past actions, but choosing a different action, a different path, I think can be so empowering. And I also think people get like scared to try something new. Cause they're like, what if I gain a bunch of weight or what if I, you know, what if this doesn't work? And it's like, well, or what if it does, what if it does work? And then you never have to go back to torturing yourself again. So I think that it's worth it to me. It's so worth it to intentionally choose that new path and forgive yourself. How did you wake up to the fact that this fitness watch was controlling you? It's so interesting. It ultimately took me moving. I moved across the country and I, I had a two week period where I wasn't exercising because I was just moving, you know, how does it moving? Like, it's just, I was moving. I didn't have a routine. I was busy, whatever. And I was like, why does my body feel so amazing? I am not exercising right now. And my body feels amazing. It's so funny because I was a physical therapist at that time. Like I had what I thought was like, I thought I knew everything. And I was like, oh shoot, this is my workout. This isn't me. This isn't a me problem. This isn't because I'm not doing enough mobility or because I need to go get body work. Like this is something that I need to change in my routine. And so I really dug into like biomechanics. I dug into neurology a little bit more like neuromuscular stuff and came across a lot of really good information about how to build muscles and how building muscle is so important and crucial for all of us to be doing as we age and completely changed my mindset. It took some time, but the more evidence I had about like, oh, this is the secret sauce, the more I realized I don't need to be torturing myself. So that was ultimately like what happened. And then that's the reason why we started at too. So I'd love to get into, you know, these nitty gritty details. I recently was listening to Jerry Seinfeld on Dak Shepard's podcast, and he mentioned that he read this book called Spark. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay, what well, it's, it? it's called Spark. I literally have ordered it. I haven't even read it, but it's basically about what's actually happening in our brain and our mind when we exercise. And he was just explaining that he never misses a day of moving his body in some way because of how beneficial it is for your mind. And I love that you've shared, thanks for sharing, that you've had personal experience with like the toxicity of fitness. I think a lot of my community has as well. So for all of us, it's like, okay, how do we think about what fitness is doing for our mind, our energy, our endorphins? Yes, our body in the sense that I want to be able to, you know, when I have kids one day, pick them all up, play sports with them, move around. You know, it's like I want to be active. So let's talk about these benefits. Like what is actually happening in our brain to us when we exercise? I mean, they say endorphins release. What's an endorphin? It's confusing. (laughs) Well, first off, it's impossible to separate the mind and the body. They're so interconnected. There's the act of exercising itself, which is, I think there's a lot of confusion around this endorphin talk. The act of exercising itself, especially at higher intensities, releases certain endorphins that make you feel good. One of those hormones is actually cortisol, which cortisol is your stress hormone. It is released during exercise. And this is because your body is perceiving some kind of physical threat, aka exercise, which isn't a bad thing if it's appropriate. And so that cortisol spike can sometimes make you feel like up and like energized and alert and that's a natural mechanism of our body. So there's what's happening during exercise. And this is why I always recommend 
that cortisol spike is good, but we want to come off of that. And we don't want to live up there in high cortisol. So coming off of that a lot, that's why we always do like mobility and breath work and relaxation at the end of your workout, because coming off of that high cortisol spike can put you in an anabolic state, which is where you actually recover and heal. Cause you don't recover and heal if you're constantly in that fight or flight nervous system, high cortisol state. So that's why we always will do like breath work and mobility at the end, land the plane, kind of bring you back down. And then, so if you are leaving your workouts and you're feeling that like high, like cortisol, that might actually, although it feels good, that might act not actually be what's benefiting you. You want to make sure that you're getting back into that relaxed state. So there's that. Now, as far as just improving your mental health in general, if you think about it, the more muscle you have, the better your body functions from a metabolic rate, from a cellular rate, you have better glucose storage, you have better insulin sensitivity, all of those things will help with your mental health. You'll have better mental clarity. You'll have better problem solving skills. You'll have a better ability to sleep, which if you sleep better, everything works better. So yeah, it's, I think I like to think about exercise instead of trying to burn calories, instead of trying to like tone up, think of exercise as building up your muscles which ultimately will help that insulin sensitivity, which will ultimately help every single process in your body, including your mental health. When you say building up your muscles, I want to dive further into it because I guess I'm thinking of what about like a bodybuilder who's got so much muscle, but is also so unhappy or when I had all my muscle in college, but was really depressed and wasn't sleeping well. It's like, I don't want people to think that if they gain muscle, like problems are solved. So what, but then I know muscle is important. So what's the like, what's the gray area there? That's the confusion. So I think with bodybuilding, it's a sport. Same thing as like athletics, right? You're exercising with the pursuit of some goal that's not just overall health. So a lot of times there's over exercise in within both athletics and bodybuilding. So just because someone looks like jacked and chiseled, but they're at the gym for three hours doesn't necessarily mean they're overall healthier. There is a balance between exercising for health and exercising for performance. So I think, you know, a lot of times when you are over exercising, you'll see the reverse benefits. You'll see joint pain, you'll see mood swings or mental health issues, depression, problem sleeping, all the things that you said you experienced. So those are some indications of over exercising or overdoing it. And there's a balance. And it, like I said, it gets really confusing. And this is why I like to say like less can be more for a lot of people. We do 30, 45 minute workouts where we're very intentional. We are placing force through your muscles in a way that will grow those muscles, but not just like depleting you and stressing you out in your workouts and screaming at you the whole time and telling you to push yourself harder and you're sweating and you're burning a million calories and you're just, you feel exhausted afterwards. Workouts like that are more likely to result in overuse, which will have the opposite effects on your health. I'm sitting here like, is that me? Because I, I have this gauge of like what a great workout is and it's what I did in college. And when I think about it, it's like I was at the highest level of collegiate volleyball, Olympic lifting. I had a five hour practice block and that's what I compare when, so then when I do a 20 minute Peloton ride or I go on a 30 minute walk, it just never feels like enough. Like I feel like I need, I am, I remember this one workout at USC where we were pushing, you're doing like sled pushes. And it was like, unless you felt like your knees were sniped and you were going to vomit, like w the workout wasn't over. And so even now, like I played pickleball with Max and our two friends the other weekend it was so fun. We played for like an hour, hour and a half and it was great. And then it ended and I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't take advantage of this. Like I'm going to run sprints. So I just ran a few sprints on the court. And as you were talking about that, Dr. Shannon, I just thought to myself, yeah, what was that desire right there that I couldn't just be satisfied with this awesome pickleball experience that I felt like I had to tap on like 10 sprints to feel totally wrecked, you know? Oh, it's, so common at the end of every class, we always say like done enough because we have to rewire that. And I will say you've done enough. Fuck that hits. <laughs> yes, you've done enough. And it's so funny because I was in the same cycle that maybe you're experiencing and I am, I have more muscle and I would say I would, I'm more fit now than I was then. And a lot of times it takes 
the logic, the evidence, the practice, you have to kind of take a leap of faith towards, oh, this is this other way. And then once you, we have so many members that are like, this is the first time I'm actually able to stay consistent because my workouts don't wreck me. I'm slowly seeing progress, not a fast, fast track for sure. There's no quick fixes, I believe, but it takes a little longer, but it is so worth it. And then you're like, oh, now this is a lifestyle. Like, I don't feel like stepping on my mat is a huge drag anymore. Like I actually look forward to it. So I think like understanding, which maybe we can get into this a little bit is like understanding the logic and the current science behind it. A lot of times helps people ultimately jump on board with this. New, I know I'm that way. Like I have to have the logic in order to change my mindset. So maybe we jump into that. If you're interested in learning about the calories and learning about like why I don't recommend tracking calories, like from a hard science standpoint, let's please please educate us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 I love to talk about this because it's just so fascinating. And I think not enough people are talking about it. So to keep myself on track, cause I could talk about this for a long time. There's three primary reasons why tracking calories burned is not as effective as we've been led to believe. The first one is that calorie tracker is either if you're on watching on your Peloton, or if you have a watch on whatever your, whatever metric you're getting your calories from, those trackers are wildly inaccurate and they've been shown study after study to be up to 80% inaccurate. So they're not actually calculating how many calories you're burning very accurately at all. But what's interesting is even if they were accurate, there's something called the constrained total energy expenditure model. And this model was coined by Herman Ponser, who was looking at hunter gatherers in Tanzania and he, who are very active. These people are in the fields they're hunting and gathering all day long. He was like, these people must burn a ton of calories. And he measured how many calories they burn each day, like thousands of them. He found that they don't burn very many more calories than the average sedentary American. And so he was like, what the heck? They're so much more active, but they're not burning more calories than, than the average American. What, what gives? And so he came across this model or he discovered this model where If you're burning calories from activity, your system essentially borrows calories from other processes throughout your body to keep you in this narrow window of energy expenditure. So essentially you aren't burning, you aren't increasing your deficit significantly by exercising more. Your body is just like, okay, I used my energy with exercise. I'm going to have less energy for digestion mental health, inflammation. This is why over-exercise can cost your mental health because you have less energy going towards your brain if you are overdoing it with the exercise. So that's reason number one is that I don't, it's honestly not an accurate and effective measure of your workout. Number two, I think that if your goal is burning calories and just depleting yourself, you're more likely to choose exercises that are potentially costing your joint health or your hormone health in the pursuit of burning more calories. So maybe you aren't being as wise as, and as intentional with your exercises that you're choosing or with the workouts that you're choosing. And then third is that I think it's a slippery slope. If you're worried about burning a lot of calories in your workouts, because it trains you to think that my workouts are the purpose of my workouts is to burn off my food or shrink my body or, or earn my food. And I, so I think it becomes a slippery slope mentally as well. So those, I cannot tell you ditching my fitness watch is truly the most freeing thing you can do. And you start to get more intuitive about your body and you actually end up seeing better results in the long term. Wow. So much there. And I'm glad we're debunking it because I very much was someone who would just like mindlessly run on the treadmill in college just to see that number climb to try to like eliminate a lunch or eliminate a dinner with that treadmill calorie number, which is, you know, it's sad. So, and about the watch, I have never even dabbled with that because I, I'm so into, I just lean intuitive in everything that I do. But the thought of waking up in the morning and being like, oh, I feel like I slept great. And then looking at my watch and it's saying, oh, you slept like shit. Like that doesn't like compute for me. And that happens to my friends all the time. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't get a good recovery. And then their whole energy changes. Like I think some of it's placebo in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. It kind of reminds me of the scale. You know, when you step on a scale, you're asking the scale, you know, do I have permission to love my body today or to like my yes. body today? And it's, I don't want to look at any sort of technology to tell me how to feel about myself. I can close my eyes for 20 seconds and be like, how do I freaking feel after sleeping? <gasps> right. Exactly. All of this tech can be helpful. 
in some ways, but a lot, in a lot of ways, it removes us from ourselves yeah. and our, your body has so much more wisdom than we even understand how to tap into. Cause we're so used to le- leaning on experts to tell us what to do. If you're an athlete leaning on your coach to tell us what to do, not asking yourself, does this feel right? Do, does this hurt? Like if I'm working out so much that I feel like I'm going to throw up, that doesn't seem right, but nobody pauses to take that inventory of yourself. And I think it's one of the most empowering things you can do. So how do we find the workouts that are right for us? Because I definitely envy the feeling of, oh, I love my workout. Or when you said, you know, your community, they're excited to get on the mat. How do you even begin to start getting active again and then find something that you want to stick with? Absolutely. I mean, I am a big proponent of, like I said, working on building muscle. We tend to lose muscle as we age. It's called sarcopenia. And it's so interesting because there was a study that I came across recently that showed that your metabolism doesn't change between the ages of 20 and 60. But the reason people experience a lot of times age-related weight gain is because they're losing muscle. So, and it's not just about weight gain, right? It's about, like I talked all the, about all the other benefits, mental health, physical health, being able to have the strength and stamina to do the things that you want in your life. So I do really recommend focusing on building muscle. And what you'll find is that when you have a routine that is focusing on, and what we do is we do one muscle group at a time. So like we'll work just glutes and then we'll work just shoulders or just back or whatever it might be. And just focus on that one muscle group at a time. We're not doing like big compound movements. We're not doing like a lot of squat to overhead presses to burpee. It's really focused. And what people feel is that it feels really good and satisfying. Like it feels like, oh yes, this is hard because my muscle is burning, but it doesn't, it's not hard in the sense that I feel like I want to throw up. It's hard in the sense that, oh, this feels really satisfying and good. Our bodies want to move. Our muscles want to work. So that's truly what I recommend shifting your mindset towards is focus on your muscles, focus how, on your, how your muscles are burning and feeling rather than focusing on how tired am I? How many calories am I burning? How much am I sweating? I think that that small transition can make the biggest difference in not only how you feel, but also in your consistency, because it's going to be a lot more enjoyable experience. What if I said that in my mind, honestly, playing sports and playing games is my most fun favorite thing, like a soccer game, a basketball game, pickleball. I'm trying to play more pickleball, spike ball, volleyball, of course. And I'm, and I'm recently been thinking, I always say like, I don't love beach volleyball. I was an indoor player. And I think the game is different in my opinion. And I just am like, oh, well, I can't play indoor volleyball, so I won't play sports. And I live near Santa Monica. I'm like, I should join a foursome, a six sum and start to play more on the weekends but would you say that I also need to have some physical activity that's just designed for muscle building or just designed for my body? Like even if I could start playing some sort of group type activity, which is so unrealistic for adults, I, someone needs to found like a gym or a recess for adults. Would yes. you say that you still recommend like at least two workouts a week where you're working on your body's muscle groups? I would, because I think that that will ultimately help you be more stable and safe when you are playing sports. I think playing sports, if if it's between like no activity and doing an activity that you love, like dancing or, you know, playing a competitive sport, please do the sport, lean into that. I don't think it needs to be all or nothing. And we also don't need to overcomplicate it. But if you are looking to truly, and I don't want to use the word optimize, it's so overused, but improve your health. There's no optimization. It's just, it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing improvement. If you want to improve your health. I really do recommend most people having some level of resistance training. And like you said, it could just be twice a week, two full body classes. And then maybe you're doing some walks and then maybe you're playing sports once or twice a week. That to me is a much better routine than killing yourself on the Peloton every single day. And I truly think that again, because it's, you're more likely to stay consistent with it and consistency. We always talk about gentle consistency is, is the secret sauce. Gentle consistency will take you so much further than intense inconsistency. Ooh, what is gentle consistency? It's basically stepping on your mat, allowing yourself to be a real human. If you have a day, I mean, we're females, we have hormones. 
that sometimes will dictate how we feel and how we perform. Literally got my period this morning. I'm like, okay, great. My whole day is changing. <laughs> yes, exactly. 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 It, and it changes your mood. It changes your ability to, for your muscles to contract. And so sometimes you're going to step on your mat and you're going to have a killer workout and you're going to feel connected and amazing. And then other days you're not. And we give you permission that not every workout needs to be a hundred percent. Sometimes you're going to have workouts that are 40% of your normal and that's okay. But just the fact, or maybe you're doing a shorter workout that day, or maybe you're taking a rest day, or we give people permission to take reset weeks where if they're feeling like depleted and burned out, take the whole week off. Like it's just about giving yourself space to be consistent in more of a gentle way, which again, I just think that it's so empowering and you're more likely to stick to a routine when you can give yourself that space. I'm so glad we've gotten to this place because I think, you know, a huge part of this conversation today has been emphasizing that it doesn't need to be this totally emotionally draining workout or pushing yourself to the limits. So we've established maybe like how you want to feel, right? What about just on paper? How often should someone be working out? Like for you, I mean, as an expert, for people starting, is it you know, if you can walk for 20 minutes a day, or if you can do at least two workouts a week, like what's the baseline, like bare minimum that we should be trying to do. And then we know within that, how we want to feel. Great question. I like to say, if you're doing nothing, just start walking and just start making walking like a part of your routine. You'll find that the more you do it, the more you enjoy it. I don't know if you feel that way. Now I'm like, I can't go without my walk. Like I I look forward to it now. Just starting walking is a great way to start to introduce that into your routine. But like I said, it's important for our health. And if I had it, if I had to, in a perfect world, recommend something for everyone to do, I do think that resistance training is important for most of us to be doing. And it doesn't have to look like the traditional Olympic lifting and squatting super heavy and lifting super heavy weights. It studies show you don't actually have to lift super heavy in order to build muscle. And we can get into that if you want, but it doesn't have to be like that. A lot of times, like we're laying on our mat for upper body build the whole time and are your, we're building muscles. And I've been able to build muscle over the span of two years, but it's not like the traditional, you know, lifting as hard as you can. It doesn't have to look like that. So my recommendation would be I think three times a week is a really good place to start resistance training and then just walk on the other days. So three full body strength training routines, if you can, I do five shorter, shorter resistance training sessions a week. And I really like that because I find that I can recover better if my workouts are shorter. So like today, for example, I did a core focus class and then I did a short hit class. And that's what I taught today. Tomorrow I'll do bar that's focused on like glutes and shoulders. I think Friday I'll do full body. So I think if you're new and you're just starting out three times a week, resistance training, and then just walk on your other days is a great place to start. And you can still build muscle with that routine. Like you can still absolutely see yourself progress with that routine. And my follow-up question, which I'm sort of just inviting you with this one to just like kind of smack me aside, upside the face is like how, I mean, then that means that I have to find three days a week. I'm going to pencil this in. I'm going to actually do it. I mean, I guess it's like, it just doesn't get easy. Like you just have to decide, like you're going to prioritize these things, right? Like there's no, there's no secret or cheat sheet to making it easier to get up out of bed and like freaking do it. A lot of it is the mental piece, but I think once you start, it's just the starting that is the most daunting for people. Once you get that first week or two out of the way, it truly becomes a lot easier to do. You start to look forward to it. You start to be like, oh, like I know how good this feels and how satisfying this feels. It's just the daunting, like I'm going to start. And we have what I also recommend if that, if that's like your barrier is like, oh, I just like, don't even want to start. I recommend easing in with, we have this whole program. It's called ease in. And it's basically just short, like 20 minute classes that are just mat based you're on your mat. It's more like Pilates, not a lot of lifting, but it's just moving your body and getting you in the habit, in the routine of moving and strengthening your body. And then you're like, Oh, okay. That wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And then you go maybe the following week to start to add the weightlifting classes or whatever it is. So that could be a great way to kind of ease yourself in is start with something that feels quote unquote easy. And then from there, build up to that. I love that. It's literally called ease in that could not be more perfect. You know what else is coming to mind is like, just the lack of 
a buddy or community. Also coming from an athletic background, you always have a team. You always have people you're doing it with. Like Max and I used to go to workouts every morning together. And then he has a crazy season in the fall. So it hasn't been working out. And in the new year, he wants to join this gym that does more of, you know, college style lifts, which he wants to do because he wants muscle gain. I don't, I'm not going to go to that. It's all, it's just way too intense for me. Not that I don't want muscle gain. I do, but I don't, I do not want to simulate my college lifts at all. Yes. <laughs> so then I'm like, okay, I'm alone. And, but then I'm thinking, Vic, you need to just go to a class. Maybe you'll meet a friend. You know, it's like, you need to find, I think too, having an accountability buddy or someone you're going to go on your walks with, or who's going to try the class with you, who's going to do the course with you. I can't encourage that enough for people to find someone so that they can have that. And I need to do that in my own life too. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And that's one of the hardest parts with virtual fitness is that there's not a community and it is so important to have a community. But I love the idea of just like being like, hey, let's do this together. Let's FaceTime each other while we're doing the workout. And just like, we'll put each other on, even if we're just doing a workout at home in our own living rooms, putting each other on FaceTime and, you know, bantering as the workout's going on and like chatting maybe a little bit or maybe not. I love that idea. I think that's beautiful of having an accountability partner. Yeah, no, fully. Well, thank you so much. This was so great, so informative. And I feel like the conversation that I needed to just reset and start to really take this seriously because it has been four years. So girl, it's it. You are not alone and it's never, it is never too late. And the biggest thing is don't shame yourself when you get back in. It's right. it's going to be just enter with gentle consistency and you'll be so happy you did. Yeah. I love the gentle consistency because I'm so all in. I'm like, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be this many days a week and I'm going to be there on time and I'm going to do this class. And it's like, I've been talking about that on Instagram recently with my community is like, why am I pushing myself to do a 630 workout class? Like I can technically Mm-mm. sleep later. Maybe I like doing a nine o'clock. Maybe I like going at four after my work day and before Max gets home, you know? So I think totally. it's really like, it's kind of like diet culture in the way that you have to completely wipe yourself of like all that you've learned to start to approach it and be like, I always say with intuitive eating, am I hungry? Is this what I want to eat? With working out, it's like, hey, what would excite me? What's the way I want to move my body that feels good? You know, what time of day do I feel most aligned to do a good job and then feel better after? So I'm really going to try to take those baby steps. Yes. I, I do this in the sense that I don't work out on the weekends. I used to never, I used to always feel guilty if I didn't do a workout on the weekend. Now I'm like, no, I just don't, I never do it. And it's so freeing. And it's like, oh, wait a second. I can relieve myself of that pressure of having to, like you said, wake up at four in the morning to make it to a six 30 workout or whatever it is. Like, ugh, like that sounds like not something I want to do. I literally hate it the night before. And I shouldn't like, I should enjoy the thing that I'm doing. So I feel that. Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I'm so glad this is going to be out there in the world with all kind of maybe the other opposite ends, like toxic, get into the fitness world messaging. So I'm glad we could kind of counter out that with this little 45 minute conversation. So thank you so, so much. Yes. Thank you for having me. You asked amazing questions. Thanks. And where can everyone join Evlo work out with you if they want to make that their program? Yes. So evlofitness.com is our website. We have an online workout program, very structured workouts. All of our workouts are designed and taught by physical therapists. So, you know, you're in good hands. I created a code for you. If they want to try it for a month, they can. So do you mind if I share it? You guys, how cool is that? (laughs) Yes. It's called, it's real, real pod. So if you use real pod at checkout, you can get a month for free. And then I also have a podcast. If you want to learn more of the sciencey nerdy stuff, it's called fit body, happy joints. And Instagram, I'm Dr. Shannon DPT. Oh my gosh. Well, I am definitely a month for free. That is a freaking steal. People like that is, I mean, there's no better excuse to get started. I will certainly be using code RealPod. Give it a try. I need to, I I actually just got a mat, so I've got to put it to you. (laughs) Yay. Okay. Yay. Perfect timing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shannon. You are welcome. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of RealPod. If this hit home or helped you in some way, send it to a friend, a teammate, roomie, share the love, share the realness. New episodes of RealPod come out every single Wednesday. So make sure you are subscribed to this podcast so you never miss an episode. 